Today's Thursday, October 16th, 2014. I'm Dan Benjamin. This is episode 30 of 5x5 Specials. We're trying this one in a fun way. We've got our whole video set up here thanks to our Patreon supporters. And uh, because of that, we're trying to do video. So here's me on video for all of those of you who supported us on Patreon. And of course, if you're sitting there listening to the audio and you're thinking, well, I just have the audio here. Well, that's all right, because this is an audio show first, video show second. I'm lucky enough to uh, to be talking to two of my friends, uh, Victor Agreta Jr., who is the editor in chief of T U A W, which some people call called Tua. Is that correct or is that wrong? That's right. Okay, yep. I can. We're allowed to say that. And Adam Christensen, who's the host of Matcast, who was kind enough to have me as a guest on his show. And for some reason, uh, a- Adam and I have sort of been circling each other in a strange orbit, and we've <laughs> both been talking about all the same stuff and just never on the the same show. So welcome, welcome both of you to the show. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. Of course, the Pretty reason that we're, the reason we're here. Victor, you you were not at the uh, Mac event, but I'm sure that you were sitting there paying close attention. I call it the Mac event, but there, it was much more than that. It was Apple's 2014 iPad launch uh, event announcement where we got to talk about uh, the new iPad uh, mini and the new iPad Air and also a Retina iMac and a new Mac mini and of lots of demos of Yosemite. So... Um, Maybe we can start with you, Victor. What was your like your take on the whole thing? I mean, what do, what do you think of of what was announced today? Nothing sort of really shocking, right? But but some nice updates, nice improvements. Yeah, it's it's Apple's continuing iteration of all of its lines. I, I think really the biggest thing was what Tim closed with, pointing out that with Yosemite, iOS eight, in the software side of things, the software and the hardware has never been this enmeshed. You know, so the handoff, continuity, all of these things are designed for Apple's ecosystem. And again, that is their biggest strength. Right. Uh, you know, and it's just laying into that that ecosystem and showing how hardware and software designed by the same people works better than anyone else can do it. Right. It's like the the integration of this, you know, bringing all of these different things together where something happens on your phone, you can work with it on your computer and vice versa. If you're writing a document here, it can show up there. And this has kind of been like the holy grail for us for a long time. And it seems like we're finally starting to get uh, this this interconnectedness that's been this magical thing that we've been wanting forever, right? I mean, how long have we been hoping that you could get a message, you could get a phone call on your phone while it's sitting next to your computer and answer it and talk on your computer? I mean, these things seem like they should just work, but the, I guess the technology behind them is like super difficult to make happen because it's taken us forever to get there. So the Yosemite stuff is really... You know, the the Mac itself is still really the the linchpin for all of this, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, Josh Topolsky, back when he was with Engadget, wrote a really good article, and he was really talking about games. You know, you can stop a game here and then on your iPhone and then go to your iPad and pick up where you left off. So uh, he's not the only one to talk about this, but it's been talked about, like you said, for years, and it's sort of weird that it's taken this long. But it's, I think so much of it had to do with the maturation of iOS devices and that platform. And so you could bring it to the Mac because there were like little hacky things you could do. You know, there's a Bluetooth software thing that you could do on the Mac. I remember doing this ages ago that would essentially turn it into a, like a headset, you know, Bluetooth headset. So you could do the two way talking. There have been software products out there that will show you caller ID and, and some other things. But the document management that Apple does. With iCloud, you know, like you're talking about, start something on your iPad, pick it back up over here, and it's all very seamless and whatnot. I, I think that a lot of work had to be done behind the scenes within frameworks to get all of these things to really function properly. And I, I haven't tested them all out, so I don't really know how well it works. I'm a little cautiously optimistic these days with Apple. <laughs> Adam, I mean, what about you? You've yeah. been watching this stuff for forever, too, right? I mean, this is... Oh, absolutely. What was your first kind of hope for what we were going to see today? And, and what do you think of what Victor's talking about? For for today's event, I, you know, I think it was pretty well known sort of what we what we were going to see. And, and uh, they delivered on a lot of the things I was hoping to see. A few things that I did that I'm sure didn't that I'm sure we'll get into. But um, on the whole sort of integration of the, the desktop platform and, and iOS and the sort of seamless transition, you know, as you're working between devices and things like that, I'm. Um, 
I, I think Victor's spot on with the software being a big, hard part of it. I mean, this is something, and I think Tim Cook pointed this out, this is something really only Apple can do because they can integrate the hardware and software. And, you know, more importantly, on the hardware side, there was hardware that had to be in there, specifically the Bluetooth low energy. Right. I mean, to have your devices be able to be constantly listening and paying attention and know when to wake up and when to be available and things like that. Um, you can't have that impact your battery performance on your mobile devices. You know, hopefully when you're you're sitting at your desk, you're able to be plugged in, but you're not always going to be plugged in. So, you know, that's another critical part of that. So being able to bring all that stuff together um, really needs to happen to get it all to work. And yeah, there's been these other solutions. There's solutions on Android and other platforms, but they're all kind of, you know, sort of hack around. So they're little kludgy things that you put together this bit and that bit, and yeah, you can kind of make it work. And Apple is one of the few companies that has the opportunity to make it really just seamless and you don't even have to think about it. And I've seen a little bit of it um, with the app stuff. I'm only disappointed because uh, I don't, all my hardware is 2011 and earlier. <laughs> right. So you're, you're Macs. locked out at like everything. So now. I'm locked out. I have no Bluetooth <laughs> low energy on any of my Macs. So right. that new iMac is like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe I need to have one of those just so I can do continuity. Yeah. And continuity is the big thing. Like this is what people are all talking about. And this is one of the biggest advantages of having kind of being a member of the small club of people who every device that they have, including their computers, kind of coexist in this one particular ecosystem. And that's the way that I think people are uh, are are used to what, you know, back in the old days, especially for those of us who've been using Macs like forever and ever and ever, um, you know, we're we're used to always having to have Mac stuff. I mean, it was a big deal when you could get your Word document that was made on a PC to work on your Mac. Like that was a <laughs> huge thing. And like, oh, he, he uses a Mac, so we, you know, we we'll have to export it as a text file. Like it was, there was no, and even then, you couldn't just. I remember when uh, you could pop the disk from uh, a PC into your Mac for the first time, and it would just work. It was like this magical thing. You know, it was like wow. I have the ability to finally trade files and it's people can no longer well, shun me and get, you know, push, push me off to the side. And, you know, so what we were very much as Mac users, we were used to saying, oh, I've got to get a Mac printer. I've got to get a Mac modem. I've got to get a Mac, whatever. It was always this thing that was like, it's got to be a Mac specific thing. And, and we, we kind of were able to get away from that for until, and I would even argue now, the best screens are made not by Apple. I mean, yeah, the Retina and the laptop stuff. But if you want an external display for your Mac Pro, Apple doesn't have a good answer for you. You know? Uh, you hit on one of the big disappointments <laughs> for me. Yeah, you were hoping big... for that Mac screen, the Retina screen? It, it, it boggles my mind that they would put out a 5k display on an iMac and not have one for their pro customers for those people who bought the the Mac pros so why we didn't get a 5k um retina HD you know what are they calling it? retina 5k 5k yeah uh Thunderbolt display is baffling a little bit to me Victor why didn't we get that you and I talked about this a year ago right I mean why where where was that I was really shocked by that too I, I I have no words. I mean, what, <laughs> what are they going to do? I, the only thing I can think is that there's something that's holding it up and they're going to release it, you know, outside of the sort of holiday cycle, because that's not really the kind of thing that you're going to open up on Christmas. Well, I would open it up on Christmas morning, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can sell that January, February, March, whatever, and still make a pretty good splash. But I wonder if they're going to do that. Like, it, it's sort of one of those things where they... You know, Apple doesn't make the XServe anymore. They make mice and keyboards that are all right and whatnot. But, you know, I'm using a Microsoft ergonomic keyboard and a Kensington trackball. Right. So I, I almost see this as an accessory, the, the screen, which is a shame for a Mac Pro customer to think of this, you know, you bought this thing. But uh, at the same time, it's like, I you know, I don't know. I don't know what's holding them up for this if they're waiting for some sort of magical cheese or something to be invented <laughs> well are we gonna have to go to we, so you know what's the answer if you want one of those you got to go to dell right now yeah you've <laughs> got to go to dell uh and um while while all of this was going on uh we were we were kind of doing a fun little thing during the live stream uh a bunch of people were tweeting to me and telling me in, in the chat room that like hey guess what there's a brand new screen that just came out and uh it's beautiful it's dell it's this 27-inch monitor has twice as many pixels as a 4K display. 
Uh, it's uh, an ultra sharp monitor. It's uh, a 5120 by 2880, which is precisely twice the resolution of the 27 inch iMac. And uh, Dell is calling it a 5K monitor, but it's technically even better than than that. They they don't have information about a price yet. Uh, or yeah, even when it's coming out, right? <laughs> but but you know, the, uh, Apple is not making this screen. We uh, because and I, again, I just wanted like we're doing the video because of the Patreon folks. So thank you again for them. But like part of what we were able to get was like we have like the Ma Mac Pro like sitting right over there, the trash can Mac Pro, and um, and that thing is crazy fast. And I've got it plugged into a three or four year old, you know, or whenever the Thunderbolt displays first came out, that's what I've got it plugged into. It doesn't, we don't need more than that here. But the fact that Apple, that's what Apple's making for us to plug into these amazing computers that can drive, you know, 4K, no problem. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. And the only reason I can think of, and, and, and I'd love to hear from other people who have, you know, who are smarter than me uh, about this, but Maybe it just doesn't make sense for them financially to do it. You know, maybe the reason that uh, that, that that it's with the iMac as opposed to uh, a standalone is it it's not the the margins aren't there unless there's also a computer living inside of it. I don't you yeah. know I don't I don't know. I've been trying to figure this out too, and year oh. after year we want this and we don't get it right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd wonder if they could you know, sort of get the pricing under control if, if they're using the same display that they would use for the 27 inch iMac, you know, they could maybe get a volume thing going, but it, it may just be, I mean, it's starting to feel like they're, they're saying, you know what, we're out of displays. I mean, even when they announced 4k support for the, the Mac pro, they were sort of promoting other displays, right? right? They were saying you should buy, here's, here's the ones to buy. And we don't, we don't have one. I mean, it may, so. you know, it may just simply be something like what they just don't, they just don't care. You know, what they care about is making uh, amazing computing devices and that, you know what, you can just go and order a screen like this from Dell, or you can, you know, you can go and, and get a decent enough screen from, uh, you know, from Best Buy or Amazon. That's, that's going to do fine. If you want a 4k display, go buy one. Uh, and Apple's content to, to make devices for us because, you know, you can't, you can't yeah. get, in my opinion, um, the, you know, the MacBook air and, and I have a, I've got a Mac pro right now. I'm actually selling it. Uh, because I use the 11 inch air constantly. That's the main machine. It doesn't have a retina display. Um, I wish it did. What do you think about not getting the fabled 12 inch uh, retina air, Victor? What, what, was this something you were hoping for? Not really. No. I mean, again, it's it, look at the iPad page and all of the SKUs that you have now. And it's sort of like, you know, I mean, we all remember when Steve came out and showed the two by two grid right. of Apple's product matrix at the time. Now, obviously life's a lot more complicated now, but <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where it's like, they have so many SKUs now that it's almost unmanageable, um, to, to, or for a consumer, you know, to go there and just sort of absorb it very quickly like consumers do. Um, but I actually think that you're right with, I don't think that they don't care. I think it's one of those things where, uh, I, I think it's a combination of profit margins um, and, you know, think about this. This is why we haven't seen an Apple TV TV with mm -hmm. it, because that's a big honking piece of glass <laughs> that they've got to ship around. That's very expensive. You've got, I mean, physical bulk in stores to stock and whatnot, and they've been making things smaller and smaller. So I think that sort of like printers, um, it's one of those areas where they're like, you know, you have good enough solutions for this. So they're content to kind of let it go through. And I don't see them innovating necessarily in the screen area as much as you know other people like dell's got this thing you know why do it right if you can't do something that's a level above everyone else yeah i mean i, yeah. rem I remember the day when we used to have mac pros in in the office and before that you know the 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 g4s but people would have these things under their desks and you'd have the beautiful apple screen on top and then it, there was this shift to the imac so that you know unless you were really doing heavy heavy duty work you're a high-end software developer, you know, you're doing video editing or something really intensive. You could say, oh, I don't need that big thing under the desk. I just want this beautiful screen, which is essentially the iMac sitting on top. Now we've got that in Retina. Again, it's it's more of this consumer focus and more people buy iMacs than Mac Pros. Obviously, um, I haven't really talked about my experience when I bought this Mac Pro that, that we have now, but, you know, I, w I went into the store and I actually got it right here in town in, in Austin from the Apple store in the domain, if you've ever been out there, and uh, picked this thing up. 
And when I picked it up, like literally like two employees came out and they're like, oh, I just, you know, we want to talk to you. But like, I was like the guy who bought the Mac Pro, <laughs> you know, it was really funny because like the guys like here, you know, if you have any questions, because it, it was a, through the business sales anyway, but even so, like they walked it out to me, they went and like, as I'm walking out with the thing, people were like, looking at it and there was like a couple guys like oh nice machine buddy you know like that that really happened <laughs> and and i just it you know nobody says a thing if you go in and walk out of there with a laptop or with a with an imac it, the mac pro is still like a, even more than it ever has been like a specialty item yeah. whereas i think everybody's got a, an imac we've got two or three here i've got one at home you know they're they're the commodity computer and now they just come with a really a nice screen uh, but Victor, what you were saying, I, I have, uh, and I've put this into the show notes. Well, by the way, the show notes are at five by five TV slash special slash 30. Uh, talk about the number of SKUs. just walking through this from, from large to small iPad air two, iPad air, iPad mini three, iPad mini two, iPad mini. And then of course, each of these with the exception of, uh, the iPad, no, actually I take that back. All of these come with, uh, in, in. At l most of them are two, if not three different Wi-Fi configurations and then three <laughs> Wi-Fi plus cellular configurations. Um, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, when you look at this, you know, you've got a 16 gig, 64 gig, 128 gig in both Wi-Fi and cellular. And then you've got that for each of the, you've got that for the iPad mini three as well. Then the iPad air has two configurations in each. And then the iPad mini has two configurations in each. And then the, the iPad mini two, that's the regular one has just the 16 gig. Can, they're not phasing these out. Like Adam, <laughs> why are they not phasing these out? Why are they uh, all still there? You can still buy the regular old fashioned mini. This is, this is the iPod. This is the, the cash cow thing that Apple does when they have a product that's revolutionized a, a market or a space and then become the sort of cash cow thing. They want to make sure that they hit every possible price point so that when a consumer walks into an Apple store and says, I want an iPad and this is how much I want to spend, um, they can do it. And unfortunately, the, the, the one really bad side of this is what I'm calling sort of the, the cruel trick Apple's playing <laughs> on consumers, which is the 16 gigabyte iPads, which they should not be selling a 16 gigabyte iPad to anyone, in my opinion, Yeah. at this point, uh, especially when they're putting in bigger cameras. And I mean, you're going to get that, that gorgeous new, you know, iPad Air 2 in 16 gigabytes and try and shoot that awesome HD video that they're showing you. And guess what? You, you got no space. And, and consumers don't think about that. And I've seen this over and over again. You know, they, they don't think about those sorts of things. They're just like, I can shoot HD video on this. And then right. they go out and they're shooting, they're trying to shoot their vacation videos and, and they're running out of space. And then they're Apple, frustrated Apple's, and it's a bad experience. Apple's done this before though. I am always oh, yeah. reminded of the, when the ice books, you know, when the iBook went from clamshell to the sleeker factor, you remember the ad, the rip mix burn ad where mm -hmm. they had the kid in the airplane and he's sitting there and he's doing all this AV stuff. And I'm like, that was a 10 gigabyte <laughs> I book. <laughs> right. No way, man. You're not cutting video on 10 gigs. Like, you know, I mean, I guess it was 320 by whatever, but <laughs> at the time. Yeah. I mean, they want to be able to say, we have an iPad that starts at 249. What's the yeah. 249? Yeah, 249 for the 16 gig iPad uh, mini. That's the price of this thing, which it's, what can you really do? I mean, let's be honest. What can you really do with that? Uh, it's like, you know, surf the web and email. Yeah. And, I mean, you can do some basic stuff, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be doing HD video or shooting, you know, or taking a lot of photos on that or even playing a lot of games. I mean, a lot of these higher end games now, I mean, they're taking a gig to two gigs just in storage right off the, right off the bat. Oh yeah. And you got to remember too, you've got a couple gigs for the operating system. So I think when you get a 16 gig model, I mean, Apple does better than some others, but I think you have about, is it 12 gigabytes available? Sort yeah, of out yeah, when starting out, yeah. Which is huge, I mean, that's a huge cut. And uh, you know, my kid, he's six, he's got, you know, he's got games, you put a couple big games on there, you put Infinity Blade 3 right. and a couple other games on there, and already you're down halfway and then these save games start taking up space and he's and like they want a movie. yeah they right. want a movie on there they or they go into one of these uh you know apps that lets them download like media content like the even the educational ones like you can download these videos and stuff and when you've downloaded the the video that well that's another half a gig well 
yeah, but my kid downloaded 20 of them. So, you know, they don't understand. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, right. The textbooks. Guess what? Some of those textbooks, three gigabytes, you know, if you're getting like the, the, what are those, the EO Wilson ones. Right. Huge. Right. Right. And, you know, it it sounds very appealing to be able to say, oh, you know, you can get, uh, you can get a really nice iPad Air for for $399. You know, you can with 16 gigs. It's, it's $50 more to go to 32. It's only, now I'm not going to say only, but if you're spending already 400 bucks. Right. Go the extra mile and spend fifty bucks. I well, honestly don't think I, I'm. I, I went. I made this transition uh, on the latest. I've got still got a five S, and I moved up uh, to the to the maximum capacity of the five S. And now that's just what I do if I'm going to be getting one of these devices. I spend extra, and you know what? I always fill it up, no matter how much space I have. I always fill it up. That's why I say it's a cool trick because I mean RAM is cheap, so Apple is loving when people buy those sixteen gigabyte models because the profit margin is so much higher for them. Well, I guess not that much higher, but it is higher. I mean, they're making more profit off those. But I mean, man, just eat a little bit of that profit and give these give these poor people at least thirty two to start. Yeah. So, Victor, will is it time for you to upgrade? Are you going to be getting something new here? What What is your latest uh, iPad? I think I'm my latest. I'm still rocking an iPad three. Yeah. So old school, big chunky monkey nice. thing. You know, it's just terrible. I have yeah. to lug this thing around, breaks my back. <laughs> ruins my Poor knees. guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it may be time. I, I really, I just got the six. And so that's my first experience on regular day use with the uh, touch ID. And so I do really like that. The fact that you'll be able to pay for stuff, not NFC, because that would be ridiculous to tap your iPad, pull that thing out <laughs> and whatnot, but online <laughs> stuff like that's actually pretty cool. So um, you know, I think maybe Christmas time I may get the uh, the new iPad Air. One interesting thing, though, is the new iPad Air has um, Apple has put in their own SIM now, and it looks like you know if you look at some of the older ones, you have you have to get the Sprint, whatever, or you have to get the ATT, you know, or Verizon or whatever. That skew is now gone for the new iPad Air because they've got their own SIM in there that will allow you to switch between those networks. So if you want to do Sprint one month and Verizon the next or whatever, you can mix and match That's huge. I didn't know that. That, I just just saw that. That's pretty cool, yeah. That is really, really cool. I mean, that's that's something that I think a lot of folks have been, including me, have been hoping for. And I think Apple's probably wanted to do that for a long, long time. Um, You know, before we go on to the next next thing... um, Apple had a neat thing uh, when they came out with the iPad Air where they had the pencil sitting there. And yep. then they pan back and they show the the iPad Air is the same height as the pencil. Very cool. Now they've got a laser that comes across and cuts <laughs> across the top of the pencil. And the iPad Air 2 is even thinner. I thought that was pretty clever. I thought that was yeah. cute. When you, uh, when you, you know, the, and they have the specs. Again, the specs are going to be in, in the show notes. Um, the depth... Of the older, the uh, regular iPad Air, still on, still for sale, is a 0.29 inches or 7.5 millimeters. The new one is 0.24 inches, 6.1 millimeters. That doesn't sound like a lot, and I don't know anybody except from reading online, like the coverage the Verge has, and folks who were there. Um, I think that makes that little bit is going to make a big difference. Though I was shocked at how much lighter the iPad Air was than the iPad uh, 3, uh, just so much lighter. And this is going to make a big difference in in the way that it feels. It's not that it's uh, it's that much lighter, but they got it just under a pound. They got it down to uh, 0.96 for the yeah. Wi-Fi and 0.98 yeah, for the Wi-Fi with, with cellular. It's amazing that the... Uh, 0.02 is the weight, I guess, of adding the cellular <laughs> modem to it. But, you know, is this a difference for people? Are people going to see this and say, oh, it's it's smaller, it's it's lighter, I that's that's why I want it? Or is that not really uh, like a selling point for anyone? It, you know, it's a marketing point. Yeah, it's a selling point. Hey, this one's thinner than, than, than the last one. Of course, I mean, people get sort of jazzed about that. But at the end of the day, is it going to make a huge difference in people's lives? I don't know about that. Here's here's one thing I have to ask you both, though, because this came up, you know, I do the iOS show with um, Jeff Gamut from Mac Observer and, and Michael Johnston. And they pointed out, or one of them had pointed out in some of the leaks that there's no um, there's no rotation lock 
switch on the iPad Air 2. Interesting. And if you, if you look at the images, it's not there. So, to, and I, for me, I thought, you know, that's not a big deal to me, but a lot of people like being able to flip that and do the rotation lock. So I guess that's all in, in software now. And I don't know if that's, I can't imagine that's a victim of them going thinner, but maybe it is. I don't know. Right. They had to figure out what to, to get rid of. And I guess if it could be controlled by software, why not? Why well, yeah, not you control have it, you it, have it in the, uh, what are they, the, the, the little slide at the control, bottom. Yeah. Control center. So here's a question. Uh, we saw this leak that happened uh, yesterday where Apple apparently leaked the specs uh, of, of, of everything on its own uh, by releasing an iBooks document that, ha that, that had all of this in there. And I mean, it, this is the kind of thing where you're, it, it seems hard to believe that this kind of thing would happen, something like this doesn't really happen to Apple a, a, a lot, but when it does, it just, it seems like how, how, how does something like this uh, happen? Victor, I mean, you follow all of the sort of, you know, the rumors and, and all of these leaks and things like that. What, what was your thinking when you saw this? Is this more like, oh, again, or was this like really exciting or what? Uh, it was kind of a little bit of, oh yeah, this has happened before and this will happen again because, <laughs> We, we actually found, uh, I can't remember, right before iBooks was announced, um, that entire initiative was announced, we somehow stumbled upon, I don't remember how, I think a, a reader may have actually tipped us to it, but we found a, a list of the publishers that would be available on launch day and a bunch of the titles that were in there mm. through this unprotected URL. And so, you know, and, and they've done a few other things like this. And it's, again, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like human error. I mean somebody screwed up and somebody's going to have a very bad day, but it does happen. <laughs> like, does someone get fired? Like people are always like, Oh, someone just got, does that, do you think that that happens? Do you think not that anymore. no, not anymore? Nah. Why? Because what would have changed? Well, Tim cook, Tim cook. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, the, uh, what was it? There, there've been a, a few screw ups in the past year in the past month. Um, and from what I understand, those folks weren't, weren't fired either. It's, uh, it's not a good day. Again, you're going to get called into someone's office and you're going to get <laughs> a little lesson in life, but, uh, you know, they're, they, they need as much talent as they have right now and more, obviously they, they need more engineers and they need uh, more cohesiveness basically. And it's, you know, it's really hard to do that, um, in a company the size of Apple and as it grows and whatnot, you're already sort of seeing some growing pains really, yeah. um, you know. So we saw, we've talked now about the, the iPad. We talked a little bit about the iMac. And you know, what's kind of interesting, worth mentioning is, yeah, they, they will talk about the processor in the iPads. Um, it seems like those get more attention than the kinds of processors uh, in, you know, when they talk about the iMac as opposed to the iPad. Like, they'll say, oh, it's got this processor. It's, it's faster. But, they, you know, they're talking about the screen. They're talking about how elegant it is. And, uh, and, and these are things that we've seen again for so long now, Apple, not really going into much detail about the specs of the computer, except for the parts that you actually will notice. You will notice as a consumer, this is the kind of camera that's in my device. And I can do things like take high resolution images that allow me to zoom in really, really close on the little guy standing at the bottom of the waterfall. Uh, or, you know, I can take slow motion or it's going to feel faster and be faster. But these details, we just kind of assume, well, of course, the new version is going to be uh, faster. That's just what has to happen. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to the internals of the iMac. Do you think that this is like a like a trend that Apple is finally at the top of that now they finally have gotten past that point of having to go over specs because they've never wanted they've Apple's never really liked doing that the way that a PC companies are all, always used to be doing that you know what I mean <laughs> they're obsessed with yeah on the on the PC side yeah the the technical you know it's got this many gigahertz and that many many megapixels and and you know these sorts of things Apple's never never played that game um, I mean you go all the way back to the IBM you know, power PC days. And they, they were big on not playing that game back then because, you know, the clock speeds didn't match up. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't even want want to do that. But I mean, I think they're focused on what really matters to the consumer. And that is how good do my images look on the screen? Right. How good do the, my 
you know, images look when I, when I'm taking my photos, you know, how, how fast are things launching? And, and I think that's the right area to focus because the point is, is that if the machine does the work that you need it to do, that's what you want. And it does it quickly and efficiently and looks great doing it. Then, you know, I mean, does the average consumer, I think probably doesn't care, you know, beyond the tech geeks, what, the clock speed of the Intel processor is, you know, is it right. an i5? Is it, a, is it a quad core? Is it an eight core? Is it a 12 core? I don't know. You know, how long does it, how long does it take me to apply a Photoshop filter? Oh, it's fast. Great. Yeah, I can move on with my life. Right. right. And <laughs> right. so, so yeah, well, so, so speaking of, you know, improvements, um, the Mac mini, and we've got tons yeah. of Mac minis here. Uh, I love, love, the, Mac. love yep. the Mac mini. Victor, you, you love the Mac mini oh, too. Yeah. We've talked about this a whole bunch. Um, it's been two, more than two years since this thing has been updated and it got a nice bump. Um, I'm looking at the specs here, fourth generation Intel processors, two Thunderbolt, two ports. Um, the base model, 1.4 gigahertz. Here I am with my specs. 1.4 gigahertz <laughs> dual core and, and Intel Core i5 processor. It's got the Intel HD graphics, uh, 5,000, 500 gig hard drive, four gigs of RAM. Uh, that's the low end one. And the top end, 2.8 gigahertz dual core, Iris graphics, eight gigs of RAM, and a one terabyte fusion drive. So we've got that now coming, trickling down from the iMac into the, uh, into the Mac mini. And you can customize it. Uh, but I, I, I saw, uh, some tweets about this from the folks who were there at the event. Uh, you can no longer upgrade the Ram yourself in the Mac mini. Uh, that was one of the things that was always nice about it. Spin the bottom, pop the Ram in. You can't do that anymore, but they've reduced the price of, uh, was it, uh, was it six, going up to 16 gigs of Ram is only 200 bucks more. Uh, for the Mac Mini, and uh, it's it starts at four hundred ninety nine bucks, which is really yeah. cheap. Uh, yeah, I what do you think of it? I wish they would have kept it at five ninety nine and based it at eight gigs of memory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, here they are, you know, sort of cheaping out on on the memory. I mean, if you're going to install OS ten Yosemite on this, do you really want to be running four gigs of memory? Gosh, no. <laughs> right? Does anybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, why? I don't, again, I don't know why I don't know why they do that because again, what that impacts and Apple has always been about this consumer experience. You know, you're going to get the person who's like, "I got a great deal. I got this Mac for 500 bucks. They're going to get it home, and if it starts bogging down, you know, again, they're not going to know about the specs. They're just going to go. Apple said this thing was supposed to be fast, and it's the latest and greatest, and it's it's not feeling like that. Yeah, so. it's really not feeling like that. And the the thing about it is, uh, 4.99, you get four gigs of RAM. Yeah. Uh, six ninety nine. Well, if you if you can customize it, but the the, the second level is six ninety nine for eight gigs. But if you if you were to go in there and configure the four gig RAM and bump it up to eight, it's a hundred bucks more. So really, we are at five ninety nine. But here's the thing about that: right. when you go into the Apple Store and you say, "Oh, I want the, you know I want the Mac Mini, uh, the low end one," it's gonna be it's gonna have four gigs, and the chance that they have a one sitting with the extra eight gigs right there they might but they might not no they're, so, yeah they're not so uh, you know then it's oh well we can install it for you and it'll you know now you've got to wait and little things like that can make a, have an effect on a purchase decision if you're ordering it online it, it makes it take longer to ship too uh you know i love the idea of an entry-level machine that's under 500 bucks me too that's like wow i have a mac it's less than 500 bucks i've never spent so little on such a powerful computer and then you say, oh, well, wait a minute. I can just go and order the RAM on Crucial. Well, that's what I always do. Well, sure. not any, not anymore. Uh, yeah. And they're also shipping it. I got to mention this um, 500 gig drive, but it's a 5,400 RPM drive. That's worth mentioning because I think a lot of people uh, are sitting there thinking, you know what? I'm a student. Uh, I want to learn video editing. I want to learn audio editing. I want to make a podcast. Um, I want to play games, whatever. 5,400 RPM. These days, especially with uh, SSD drives around, that is is dog slow, uh, yeah, and the the fusion drive is two hundred and fifty bucks more. Victor, uh, come on. <laughs> yeah, no. It, listen, it, you know, 
one of the things that I see a lot of people doing now are these uh, game casts, you know, where they'll do the video and then, you know, like Captain Sparkles, PewDiePie, whatever, that sort of thing. Right. You have to have a pretty fast hard drive to do that. Your computer is doing a lot of stuff. If you're playing a uh, game title, I mean, even if it's Minecraft and you're recording video that, you know, it's getting from the camera or another camera, or whatever, all of this stuff, that that requires a lot of RAM. It requires a fast hard drive. Yeah. And people are going to get this cheap Mac mini in a college dorm and think they can do all this stuff and be the next PewDiePie. And it's more like the stuttering PewDiePie is what they're going to be. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too, it's too true. And this is something that I think Apple used to get a lot of criticism for way back in the day was, oh, you know what? They sell their machines with too little RAM. That was mm -hmm. just, that's just how they did it. And then to get more RAM from Apple was, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah. of dollars, six hundred dollars to get, you know, a decent amount of RAM. And it always seemed like the reason that Apple did that was to kind of compete on price in a way because the machine itself generally tended to be so expensive. But those days are historical now. And, you know, you can just comparing uh, you know, the the an iMac, not necessarily the uh the retina one, uh, but the lowest end iMac, a 21 and a half inch iMac is gonna ship with eight gigs of RAM, it's a 21 inch, 1.4 gigahertz, uh, dual core Intel. That's going to have eight gigs of RAM. I, are they saying something about the Mac mini by offering it in such a low configuration? You know, I, I can still see the argument for someone who says, I just really want to browse the web and do email on my iPad. And that's an, I only right. need 16 gigs of storage. This is, we're talking about RAM. We're not talking about storage here. We're talking about you know, a machine that's that's a computer that's going to really, especially with Yosemite, they're really going to suck up that RAM, you know? Right. Four gigs just seems impossibly small. Yeah, it seems not right. Like I said, I, you know, it, they just make it very hard to recommend the base model of most of their things to any consumer. I mean, be it iPad or iPhone or um, now Mac Mini or even even iMac. The iMac is pretty pretty decent at its base configuration. The, the yeah. standard iMac and and you know like the MacBook Air is probably I think okay. Well, now it's back at four gigs of memory as well. So yeah, I mean I I just have found it very hard. You know when people come and they're asking me, I, you know I only have this much to spend. I've had a PC. This is what it costs, and the Macs are looking really um, more affordable on the low end. And then I got to turn around and tell them, mm, yeah, you probably probably want that middle of the you know, Apple's always been sort of get the middle range one, and that's the good one for most people. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's more expensive. You're going to be spending a couple hundred bucks more. But I think long term, you, you know, the consumer is going to be very much happier with oh, that yeah. purchase decision. Oh, yeah, they'll be much happier. But, you know, the other thing, and they're, they're talking about this in, in the chat room a little bit, is, um, you know, that pretty much, well, we know all the, all the laptops have uh, soldered RAM. Uh, right. But... The thing that used to be appealing about computers in general for those of us who weren't afraid to open them up at some point is that you could say, well, I'll get the low end configuration now. You know what? If in a year or two I, I want to kind of give my machine a little <laughs> upgrade, I'll spend another two, three hundred bucks and put in more RAM and I'll have a whole new computer. That used to be the thing. You know, oh, I'll put in a new drive and some new, new RAM and I got a whole new computer. This computer that I got two years ago is now going to last me another two years with only a few hundred dollar investment, you know, upgrading that. I remember when we could finally get SSD drives affordably. We could get right. them, we could put them in and then we'd clone them and, uh, and pff, new computer, super fast, great. Same thing with the RAM, boosting the RAM as you grow. Oh, I was a student and I put more RAM in when I graduated. And now I can do my my freelance work. I can play that new game. You can't do that now. If you yeah. get if you get pretty much all of these machines, they they have the RAM in them that they have. I think the, uh, AF Waller in the chat room was saying the only exception to that is uh, is the Mac Pro, and I I think he's right about that. That that is the last Mac that you can still upgrade to RAM. Do we know on the Retina uh, 5K? If you can upgrade that, let's see what it's, it, it, it just says learn you, more. You could, so do the 20, you could do the 27 iMac prior. It was, a, yeah, the 21 was right. an upgrade. I, I might be getting this backwards. One of them was upgradable with RAM and the other one wasn't. I think it was the larger 
I think the 27 was and the 21 wasn't, but the chat room will probably correct me if I've got that. Yeah, backwards. chat room, let us know uh, what the story on that <laughs> was. Pull, I should pull up Mac Tracker and look. The Mac Mommy in the chat room says, I just put an SSD drive in my 2009 MacBook Pro happy as a clam. I mean, that's that's the kind of yeah, thing that we're, we're going away from being able to <laughs> to do that now. And I mean, I guess I guess that makes Apple happy because it means we buy more stuff but um machines well again the, yeah so it just becomes more important as i'm talking to people about you know which model to get that i tell them avoid the bottom of the line you want at least the middle of the line or you want you know to max the thing out so that you can have it for i mean i i'm used to having my max for between three to five years and i prefer to have them more on the five year year end like i said i mean the my most current Mac I have right now is a 2011, you know, early 2011 MacBook Pro, and I have a 2011 uh, MacBook Air. And the Pro I'm able to bring along because I did put an SSD in it and I up, I upgraded the RAM. Right. I, you know, had I not had that option, I probably would have replaced it a year or two ago. Very okay, it's a, it, it says on, on the page for the iMac Retina, 8 gigabytes, 2 4 gigs, DDR3 memory, 4 SO DIMM slots, user accessible, configurable to 16 or 32 gig. Cool. So, okay. so there is, there's keep, one more. They did keep that part of the design around. Yeah. All right. Now, before we talk, there's a couple more things I want to hit before I uh, before I let you guys go back to uh, back to work there. Uh, but before we do that, I want, I want to tell you about our, our sponsor. It's MailChimp. Easy email newsletters. These guys have been a long, long, long time supporter of 5 by 5 We We sure do like these folks. Uh, what they do is they make it easy to send newsletters. It seems like that should be an easy thing, but it's not because there are a million uh, different uh, email clients out there. People are using these things called iPhones to read email now, and you want your newsletter to look good. You know, you want to be in touch with the folks that are uh, are supporting the stuff that you do, the people who are your customers, your clients, potentially new customers and clients, right? And you send them an email and it looks like crap. Well, guess what? They're not going to read it. It's that simple. They have the most amazing templates and they test all of these things. You can control the content with drag and drop. I just sent an email out. Uh, like I mentioned, we're, we're doing this whole Patreon thing to, to help uh, help with our video stuff. And there were some people who had been donating to 5x5 five five, like for years and years on PayPal. And uh, and I kind of wanted them to like get off PayPal and get over to Patreon. So I had this newsletter and I, and I sent out a newsletter and I said, you know what, I'm going to use one of these new templates that they have that are all drag and drop. And it couldn't possibly be easier. Editing is instantaneous. Uh, you build your campaign and then you get to see real time. Oh, well, 300 emails went out. How many people have opened the email? What percentage of people clicked the links inside of the email? And of course, MailChimp does really cool things like making a, a text version of the email uh, automatically so that you can design this beautiful thing. But there is plenty of, uh, of of email clients or people with with email readers that they just get the text version and they just want the text version. And what's also really cool, people like Dave Pell, who, who does Next Draft, uh, this is really, really great daily newsletter. The uh, It actually creates and makes a little web page out of every issue. And you can share those with your friends. You can share them on Twitter. And you can go and read this without even subscribing to the newsletter. So it's, it's very cool. And there are some people who charge for their newsletters. Well, that's all built into MailChimp too. So special URL. If you go to MailChimp.com slash 5x5, you can have uh, this. This is their free entrepreneur plan. 2,000 s- subscribers and uh, 12,000 emails per month for free forever if you go to that URL, MailChimp.com slash 5x5. Thanks very much to them for making the show possible. So uh, the last couple things uh, that uh, that I wanted to talk about are actually more just specific to, you know, they demoed a lot of apps. Uh, they talked a lot about Yosemite. Um, we've got on Monday, uh, Apple Pay launching for real. Uh, 500 more banks have said they'll work with Apple Pay since the, they first announced it last month. Victor, this is going to be exciting uh, to you, right? You've got a, an iPhone 6. You're ready to go out and start using this? That's That was actually a big motivator for me to get an iPhone 6 because I do travel a lot. And, you know, at airports, you've always got Starbucks. You've always got, uh, in most cities, you have things like Target and whatnot. So a lot of the retailers that have already signed up and whatnot – it sounds like it's going to be easy peasy for me to try it. And I'm absolutely giddy to get to try this on Monday. Yeah. 
Where are you are you going to like hit up a Starbucks like Monday morning and they, they won't be in every Starbucks, right? How do you, is there going to be one in your area? Actually, there's a uh, there's a Walgreens that I usually go that I get my prescriptions from and whatnot. And so I'm <laughs> going to go and just get you know a soda or something and try it that way. That's cool. You got to like a you know live. Uh, well, you can't you can't record it with your phone while you're using your phone. But yeah, I think that'd be cool. I want to see this in real life. I want to see real people using this and see what the yeah. There you go. Bring your. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> bring your iPad and video it. Adam, what about you? I mean, uh, you're you're on a 5S still, right? No, no. I got oh, you a got the plus. 6. Everyone but me has a 6. Oh, you got a 6 Plus? What do you think of that? Um, I'm learning to live with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The glowing review things. from Adam Christensen. I'm learning yeah, I mean, to I've live talk, with my 6 I've Plus. I've talked about it. Well, I kind of, I kind of made the choice like at the, at, the, at the late hour, right, when I was ordering. Yeah. Uh, I, and I went, you know, I really want to have the thing that's, the most different so that I can really kind of get a feel for what this experience is like. Right. And sort of what put me over the edge, I, I said, was the, you know, some of the UI things. So I think right now, you know, um, having the, having the enhanced UI is great in Apple's apps. I'm really looking forward to see what, uh, what creative developers do with it. I think there's going to be some amazing things that are going to take advantage of the larger screen. Yeah. Um, I like the larger screen for a number of things. I, you know, I like it for watching movies. I like it that doing navigation in the car is incredible yeah. with it. Um, so some of those things put me over the, over the top, it, you know, the size it's cumbersome, it's big, you know, there, there's just no way around that. And when I say I'm learning to live with it, you know, I'm adapting. Mm -hmm. Um, it definitely for me is there's no way it's a, I, I can kind of use it one handed, but it, the experience sucks. I, I hate using it one handed. So it is a two handed device for sure. So yeah, you know, you that's the quick synopsis of the six plus. We always used to joke that, you know, you could tell someone's age by the way that they held their uh their their phone their smartphone if they held it in two hands like this and and and, and typed with the two thumbs then uh you know then you kind of knew okay they're they're a younger person and then if they held right. it and kind of hunt hunt and packed with the one holding it but you know a phone that, that that's that size kind of forces you to do the the two-handed thing unless you are a, a simply giant human uh <laughs> but uh yeah. so so you've got we've got we've got a payment system hitting apple pay uh, yeah. apple pay on monday that's going to be huge the couple things that they showed us is, you know, with with uh, iOS 8.1, and pretty much anyone can can go and get the beta version uh, of that. Uh, iCloud Photo Library was the big thing that they talked about. This is the, <laughs> a replacement for Photo Stream. You're laughing. What do you think yeah, about? Yeah, I'm this? laughing because I think it's awesome. But I, they were pointing out, I think, during the keynote that, hey, this is, this is your full, you know, full size photos. So you got your eight megapixel camera, right? right. You're uploading the full size photo into your iCloud library and it uses your iCloud storage. Right. And, you know, I get five gigabytes for free. That's yeah, nothing, is, man. This is all about selling more more iCloud storage. Right. They're, it really they're, is. They're going to make some money off of this one. I mean, it's great. I think it's a great feature, and I think a lot of people are really going to like it. But again, I think the consumer experience that's going to happen and you're going to hear about is people are going to be like, I'm all out of iCloud storage. What's going on? I don't understand. You know? That, that's already happening because, uh, you know, like my daughter is a tween, and she takes so many pictures that she can't back up her phone now. She's got a 16-gig iPhone uh, 5C. And right. she, you know, it's got that stupid warning, which apparently kids don't care about. I, her, her Mac <laughs> also has the, you know, update tonight. And she's like, whatever, just playing stuff and ignoring it. But to me, it drives me insane. And I sit there and see her thing. It's like, it has been backed up. So what happens if, you know, and again, it's one of those things where Apple's cheaping out on online storage. As a user experience, if you lose your phone and lose all your data, then you're going to be really mad. Yeah. 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 The, the, and so I'm worried about some of the things that Apple's doing because it seems like over and over they're they're putting some things before that user experience. And that's a change that, you know, it's it's seems to be happening and it's something that I'm kind of paying attention to attention to closely. I don't want to panic just yet, but it does kind of make you scratch your head and you go, you know, you're, you're kind of not putting the consumer experience first here on this one. You know, there's there's something else going on here. And you don't want to jump right to profit, but you're kind of going, this feels like it is. You're going right to, you know, we want more profit margin. We want you to buy the more expensive uh, iPad. We want you to buy the the more expensive Mac. We want you to buy, you know, more storage, those sorts of things. Yeah. So. And Victor, not only can't uh, can't your daughter back her phone up, she won't be able to upgrade the OS either anytime That's soon. Right. Uh, and that that happened to me. It happened to, uh, to Hattie, who works with me, and a number of other people like, 
couldn't do it. And so this kind of, you know, it, we're all looking for, uh, for a way to, you know, back up our data. But then it's whenever it comes to like, I had, I had my entire photo library that I've ever taken with the phone for like the last three phones, you know, each time I would, I would migrate to the new, to the new phone and then migrate again to the new phone, keep doing that every time until uh, essentially I had like a, uh, you know, a, a three or plus, four year history of phones, uh, of pictures on my phone that was just taking up space. And, uh, and yeah. you know, I had to, I had to clear that off. And that's always a little bit scary because I don't, you know, I'm not a photo stream user because I take way too many pictures and one out of every 15 pictures of my kids is, is worth saving. So I don't really want photo stream. I don't really want all of those to go up to the cloud oh. and, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm atypical. There's creative technology ways Apple can solve this problem, you know, and, and they should be looking at and thinking about those. I mean, there should be a way to, to, you know, shuffle off stuff to less immediate archival storage that's maybe cheaper for them to maintain in the cloud and just let, let people have that as a location. I mean, th there are ways to solve this, and it, it seems like they need to step up and start thinking about that. But again, Apple's never been very good at this cloud stuff either, yeah. you know, so they, they, they may very well be on this huge learning curve as well. And hopefully it gets better, especially with the competitors out there. You know, there are a lot more affordable um, options for doing online storage and just like you, you know, a lot of people may suddenly realize when it's not just working for them, you know, what, I'm going to go look for something better. I'm going to yeah. look for another solution for this because this is, this experience is not the experience I want. Yeah. Good point. Uh, you know, the, the last thing that I want to ask you guys both about Victor, we can start with you. Uh, Yosemite is coming out at some point later. Maybe it's even already out. Uh, you've probably been experimenting with the betas. Are, do you think that uh, you'll be installing this on your primary machine ready to go right now if you haven't already done that with the betas? Um, I actually haven't played with the betas. I have a policy where I like to experience things at the same time as everybody else. I mean, I, I read and you know I keep up with everything so I know kind of what to expect. And of course, I talk to people on the team who are testing the betas and whatnot. But I actually like to experience it sort of in real time as every other schmuck out there. <laughs> and so I'm looking, f I'm really looking forward to it. I'm a little bit nervous about some of the things that I've heard, but I think overall continuity and handoff and all these other things, it's, it's, I have a lot of friends who have Android phones and I'm tired of whipping out my iPhone every time I have to message them back. So that alone will save me a ton of time. There you go. <laughs> Adam, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I I do a lot of work on on my main machine, so I, I'm probably not going to upgrade it day one. I'm going to wait a little while. I got to check on some people. A lot of it for me though is the the underlying stuff. So you know, I do web development. And I've got you know version control and and all kinds of you know Ruby stuff and all kinds of things under the hood that I got to know still works. Um, and you never know when you sort of upgrade like that. So I have a MacBook Air that I've been playing around with it on, um, and I'll definitely upgrade that and. I can tell you with that experience, that seems to have been pretty seamless. So if that continues with the release version, I think a lot of people are going to be are going to be just fine. It seemed like most of my apps um, just worked, you know, with with yeah. the, the new OS. But always you got to be careful, right? And check and go to roaring apps or whatever it might right. be for right. that that more obscure stuff. There's always going to be something, and this is why I don't do my production machine. There's always going to be that one thing that you kind of forget about that you don't realize you rely on and maybe you rely on it once a month or once every other month. Right. Yeah. And then you've upgraded and then you go to do that thing and you're like, Oh, that's the one that's going to bite you. Right. Right. That, right. You know, you can, you can, you know, all of the, the, you know, you're using logic pro, well, that'll work just fine. But then that one little app that you use to do that little conversion, when you export the file, oh, that didn't work. So I have i uh, I've got a, um, an iMac that we're going to be putting it on to, to sort of test out and try out. But you know, when you, I used to be one of those early adopters, like the minute I could get that beta, I would install it. And now it's like, we have machines that they have jobs, you know, and yeah. I'm perfectly <laughs> okay with that machine that's doing its job well, not having the latest, greatest thing. That's perfectly okay. It, because it's doing a job, you know, the machine that's recording the audio of this right now, I only very recently upgraded it to Mavericks and uh, and and I felt like it was too soon to do that. You know, the Mac Pro that's over there that that shipped with Mavericks. I have no plans to put Yosemite on that for months and months. It's doing its job and and it's doing a good job at its job. So I <laughs> that's I okay. Like 
I waited like six months on my main machine to go to uh, to Mavericks, and uh, I'm probably not going to do that this time around. Yosemite, I'm I'm pretty itching to get get upgraded to that. It's actually a really nice upgrade, just visually and and all the way around. I I think it's um, I'm looking forward to a lot of features in that one more so than I was with Mavericks. So uh, maybe a month or two. I just Probably I want <laughs> I want everyone else to do my testing for me. I want to right. hear that it works with Logic. I want to hear that it works with uh, Pro Tools and uh, you know and and Final Cut Pro. And once everybody's like, yeah, it works with that. And I've hooked up an Apollo to it, and the Apollo works fine. And you know all these other crazy weird little devices that we have sitting around. Once someone else does that work, and they're like, okay, Dan, you, you can do it now. Then you know and. I think Apple's gotten so much better when a new operating system comes out about um, about giving us that comfort. The fact that they've released it so early as a beta, public beta, for the whole world, not just developers, but the whole world to go and try and out, try out. That says something. So, um, yeah, I'll be giving it a try on my main desktop machine, not on my laptop, though. So we'll see how that goes. All right. If people have enjoyed listening to you guys as much as I have, where can they go to follow you? Victor, you are at super pixels on Twitter, right? Super That's pixels. Right. And right now your avatar is a you on a $1 bill. I love it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's great. You also work over at, uh, Tua, T U A W dot com. Busy making sure that that thing publishes. And, uh, what, what, uh, where, where else can people go to, to find you and follow you? Is that the best place? Uh, yeah, tuaw.com, and then I have my personal site is superpixel.com without the S at the end. I'll put that into the show notes as well. And, of course, if uh, if you enjoy listening to uh, to Adam as much as I do, you probably already know that he is the, uh, he is the host of MacCast, one of the longest, most ancient shows, <laughs> uh, uh, podcasts around. Uh, yeah. But you can you can go. That is at maccast.com and your maccast on Twitter and where where else? You mentioned the iOS show. What what else are you up yeah, to? Yeah, the iOS show dot com. Uh, that's more iOS focused. And I'm a regular on the uh, the Mac show on the British Tech Network. So if you're in the UK over in that region, yeah, well, you can listen to it obviously anywhere. But it has more of a, a UK focus than uh, probably a lot of the stuff that I do. So that's British Tech Network dot com. Very cool. Well, thanks again to both of you guys who who decided to join me at the very, very last uh, minute. I appreciate it, and uh, have a great day. And Victor, please do take a video of your first uh, Walgreens purchase with your <laughs> oh, I will. with your phone. All right, guys. Thanks, thanks again. Take care. Thanks. Bye.